back to day six it is uh monday and freezing cold in melbourne wherever you are in the world welcome it is so great to have you here um we are in for a bit of a ripper session this this morning um, rob pine who is an expert expert in all things teams and leadership teams um he helps them unleash their collective intelligence he's got a background as a chief strategy officer and a degree in psychology he focuses on how senior teams work together, what their barriers to success are, and how to build a culture of trust, achievement, and collective intelligence. Rob works with leadership teams that deliver lasting change with year-long partnerships, as well as short-term strategic projects, team offsites, and skilled-based masterclasses. Rob has worked with many of Australia's biggest and most progressive companies. And this morning, he's gonna to talk to us about how teams shape the future and what they get wrong. And so welcome, Rob, it's great to have you here. I know I've certainly worked in some great teams and some not so great teams over my career. So I'm interested to see what you've got to say about what they get wrong and uh, really appreciate you coming back to uh, run another session at VID this year. Thank you, Julia. And I think if we're gonna to talk today around how teams shape the future and what they get wrong, I wanted to kind of kick off with a, um, a story about shaping my own future, I think might give us a couple of learnings that I still use today with teams. So I want you to imagine yourself on the front of the Manly Ferry. This is somewhere I used to spend a bit of time on the way to work from where I live in Manly into the city of Sydney. I would stand right on the front, like my Titanic moment on the prow, looking for dolphins and whales occasionally and just kind of considering the world. And one morning in February, about eight years ago. I was kind of not in a great place with my work. I don't know if any of you can relate to this, but work had kind of lost a bit of meaning. I wasn't enjoying it. It didn't feel like it suited my values. I'm just sailing on the front of the ferry through. I've got the Harbour Bridge on one side and the Opera House on the other side. So a wonderful kind of vista, if you like. And I'm thinking, what can I do differently with my life compared to this kind of job I've got as a, I was a chief strategy officer back then? And at that point, I've been reading this book by around. It was about Google and the history of Google and how they've managed to make a lot of money whilst also being quite purposeful, if you could say that, in unleashing the world's information and making it useful. So they had a bit of a purpose. They're also making money. And I was like, what can I do this like that that pays my mortgage, but it's also kind of has some kind of impact on the world? And I came back on this morning to something I'd done a few years previously. Like I'd done a degree in psychology and I'd specialized in human decision making. And for me, I had this literally a bit of a light bulb eureka moment on the front of the Manly Ferry where I was like, well, hang on, if Google unleashes the world's information, I'm not sure people really know how to use it to make decisions wisely. So why don't I set up a company to help the world make better decisions? Bingo, right? That was my eureka moment. And um, so on the front of the Manly Ferry that day, I had an idea that still lives today, which is cool, but that's not the bit of the story I wanted to kind of make a point about. The point was that as I then pulled in to Circular Key Wharf, I was like, right, I can just go in and quit my job right now. But what I thought to myself was, hang on, if I'm going to help people make better decisions, that doesn't seem like the best way to do it, to just have an idea and then quit your job 10 minutes later. Right? I hope you can kind of relate to that. It's probably a little bit shotgun. So I want to share with you a couple of things I did to pause for a couple of days and think about how to shape your own future. This might be relevant to you as an individual, and it's certainly the stuff I use with teams all the times as well. So I kind of paused. I decided I'm not going to resign today. I've had the idea. The idea seems good, but here's what I'm going to do. First thing, I'm going to make sure I've got more than one option. And this is a classic decision-making strategy. That we don't want to make a decision. We've only got one option. So I came up with three options, which is fix my current job, get a new job somewhere else, or create my own business. So I had three good options. The second thing I want to do, right, is I want to make sure that I've got a clear way of comparing those options. So I call this creating clever criteria. And ideally I want about three of them. So I thought, well, you know, what is it that I want in a job or a career or a business? And it was three things again. It was 
what suits my values, what uses my strengths and what will pay my mortgage. And so I started to get a good shape of this decision. I had options, I had criteria. You can imagine that as a little grid if you like. And that was kind of working for me because writing things down is a lot better than just popping ideas in your head. But the third thing I did was maybe the most interesting and I want to share it with you. It's I, I borrowed it from someone else and I use it with teams a lot and it's called a pre-mortem. So you know that a post-mortem when it comes to work, for example, is about looking back on the project and saying, what worked and what didn't and why did this project die basically so the idea of a pre-mortem that's from a guy called gary klein says uh, let's think about where we are today when we start the project and then imagine we're 12 months in the future and it has died a horrible death what went wrong so what i did was i invited two or three of my or three of my really kind of people i trusted their advice and they knew a little bit about entrepreneurialism and stuff like that I invited them around and I showed them my business plan. This is like a couple of days later, it's on the Sunday. And I said, now, imagine it's a year's time, it's been a complete disaster. What went wrong? And by looking back from the future, they were able to fill in the gaps in that story. And they said things like, what if you get sick? What if you can't get access to the decision makers? What if you don't like working from home? Well, I still work today, luckily. And, um, that was super useful for me because they surfaced some things I hadn't thought about, very practical. And Gary Klein's pre-mortem technique is proven to surface 30% more real risks. So it's much better than me if I just showed my business plan and said, hey, what do you think? They might have said, what about cash flow and some serious stuff like that? The pre-mortem surface is kind of more practical risks. So it's super useful. I ended up feeling more realistically confident about my decision. So I've been on the front of the Manly Ferry and had this idea on a Friday morning. And on Tuesday, three days later, having gone through a few steps and taken a bit of a pause, I walked into my boss's office and resigned. Thank you, Sue. Yeah, there's like a black hat session. And the good thing, Sue, about being um, black hat is you want everyone to be the black hat at the same time. That's what the pre-mortem does, which is much better than one person in your um, group always being the black hat when everyone else is trying to be positive. So you want to be all black hat at the same time. The funny thing is when groups do this, when teams do this, Sue, and everyone else here, um, they actually really enjoy it. They get a lot of energy about the permission to say, what if our project fails? Right? So the pre-mortem is kind of connects my story about shaping my future um, and making, trying to make a good decision about it into what we're going to talk about today, which is around how teams think and how they shape the future. So I do have a couple of slides to share with you. Um, but I'm going to try and also kind of make it a little bit interactive and discussion based as well. So I have a question for you. I have a question for you, which I will put, I'll just actually uh, get you to think about this and put something in the chat box. So if you get your chat box open, if we think about teams shaping the future, why do teams matter when it comes to shaping the future? Um, diverse opinions, thank you, Judith. Yeah. If you think about, you've got to come up with some ideas about the future, you've got to make plans, and then you've got to get people on board. Yeah, we're definitely looking at, um, in the first instance, how do we capture more perspectives so that we can have a better view of what the future might hold? And momentum and support, brilliant, this is awesome. And so you can probably see that teams play a role at every step from coming up with the ideas about where do we want to head as a business and how are we going to shape our own future and maybe change our category or change the world even, right? So we're getting their perspectives there. We're also, they, we need help making plans Right? And this is a step that most leadership teams aren't good enough at, is turning their ideas into plans. And teams can really help that, particularly if you've got some of those really wonderful people in your team who are great at the project management and planning and implementation, the stuff that I'm terrible at. Right? Maybe you are too. So we need a team around us to do that. And then, of course, there's the people perspective. That if we have a great leadership team or a senior team around us, it helps us harness the whole of the wider organization into our message. And this is an important moment for all of you, I think, or for all of us here, because it turns out that only 7% of employees in the average company understand what their company strategy is and what their goals are and how their goals relate to the strategy. So there's this huge disconnect and hopefully your team, if you get it right, you get the plans right, you get the team around you right, you can spread that shaping of the future, that vision and your strategy and your plans so that everyone feels connected. 
So teams play this huge part. So I know this whole conference is about shaping the future. And I want to come in and say, you know what, have the team around you and do something which I call unlocking team intelligence. That's the kind of principle of my kind of session today is how can you unlock the intelligence of the people around you? That's my proposition, if you like, because I started out on the Manly Ferry eight years ago saying I help people make better decisions. And I um, these days I've found that the best way of doing that is to work with teams because individuals it's quite hard to change their decision making style because they do it a lot on the fly. There's a lot of gut feel. It can be quite rapid and they're not aware necessarily of their own biases in making those decisions, such as their overconfidence. When you're working with a team, particularly a senior team, you have a moment that you can intervene and actually help them, which might be the leadership team meeting. The decision making and the shaping of the future might be built on a strategic process over a day or a week or a month. So you've actually got more ways in. And the other thing I think I just want you to connect with is that when a team are making a decision, it's easy for different members to spot the biases so they can see that Rob's being a bit overconfident. Yeah. Or that Sarah is being a bit black hat and they can try and correct each other and call each other out if you get the emotional foundations built. So teams are super important when it comes to shaping the future. So important, in fact, I decided to write a book about it. So coming out on June 1 is my book, which is called Unlock. And it's about leadership teams. And some of the stuff I'm going to share with you today is built on all the research and development I did to, um, to bring to the world a book that's a, really about how teams shape the future. It's not called that. It's about how do you make decisions and run strategies and make plans in your business with your senior team. Now, Marie, I've seen your comment in the text box there, so I'll try and come back to it later. Um, particularly if you put in the text in the chat box there, which statistic you're after, because I've got all these sourced in a massive spreadsheet. Okay, so now my book and the conversation we have today might be built on this simple Venn diagram that is over the course of eight years working with senior teams and leadership teams and doing a whole bunch of interesting stuff. I realized there are probably only three things that a leadership team or a senior team needs to um, Think about the three spheres of influence you like that make a nice Venn diagram. And the first one on top left is the strategy. So what is it we're trying to do? And on the top right, we've got delivery or productivity or tasks. Like so how do the tasks map to the strategy? And down the bottom, we've got people. And they're at the bottom because they power everything. How do the people we've got connect to the tasks we're asking to them that connect to the strategy? So this all works together. And what I found was maybe a little bit more nuanced underneath that was that as an individual and even as a team, we need different types of intelligence to power those three spheres. So if you think about strategy, we need to have that classic IQ, that analytical creative intelligence to map out what might happen. But for delivery and project management and tasks and productivity, we need a different type of intelligence, which I call PQ or practical intelligence which is how do you take that idea and actually put it into a plan and a roadmap? And that is a very different type of skill. It's a different type of thinking. And it's to a certain extent, different type of people are a bit better at that. And down the bottom, we've got the, the importance of people. So not just the people in your team and how that functions, but the kind of wider culture as well. And for that, we need what you know, emotional intelligence is the key aspect there. So when I work with individuals or with teams, I'm looking at how, how are you shaped on these three types of intelligence, okay? Um, and what I'm gonna do is just in a chat box, I'm just gonna ask for your opinions here. If you reflect on yourself, do you have a kind of preference for one or two of those types of intelligence? Are you a more strategic IQ kind of person? Or are you a more kind of practical kind of person with the practical intelligence or PQ? Or are you kind of leading with your EQ? And I find that most people have either one or two of those that they're more comfortable, more at home with. So I wonder if you can have a little think about that and pop something in the chat box. EQ and PQ. Thank you, Josie. Okay. Excellent. Thank you for those answers, everyone. Awesome. IQ and EQ. Yeah. And everyone's different, but it's hard. It's really hard to be good at all three of them. Right. Um, really hard. Uh, the good news is that you can improve on all of them, particularly when it comes to teams, right? Because Whilst you might think about your own IQ, research from the MIT 
Center for Collective Intelligence, and particularly a researcher called Anita Williams Woolley, tells us that the collective intelligence of a team is actually not the same as the average intelligence of each member. Right? Things happen in teams, in the dynamics and the relationships between the team members that mean that a team can be much more intelligent than some of its parts, or it can be less intelligent. And uh, in the book, The Fifth Discipline, uh, a writer called Peter Senge wrote a great book called The Fifth Discipline about the learning organization. And he quotes, how can a team of managers with IQs of 120 collectively have an IQ of 63? And that's the, generally the problem I'm trying to solve is how do you make sure successful individual leaders and managers actually combine together to be more than some of their parts? All right. Now, I want you now to be thinking about your team. I want you to be thinking about your team. And when we think of those three types of intelligence, we can actually turn it into a little bit of a ladder, which I'm going to walk you through. And I want you to think about the, the team you're in today, assuming you're here because you're in a team, right? The team you're in today, where does it sit on this ladder? Most teams that I engage with are kind of sitting around what I'm going to call level two. There are more levels coming here. I'm doing a bit of a build, right? But look at level two which is where they're a little bit dysfunctional. It's a bit siloed and individual. We come together and just update each other on what's happening in our patch, okay? I call that actually a bit dysfunctional. Now, at that point, the intervention you need to make is actually to turn it into a real team with a compelling vision. So a lot of teams are actually just a collection of people that haven't, they're not actually supporting each other as a real team uh, or collaborating and they're not really pointing together towards the same kind of vision, right? So that's what we need to do there. And if you don't get that right, that's where teams tend to start out. They're like a bit clunky. Where are we going? We're forming, we're kind of norming. And about 10% of teams dive down into toxic over time. Like the relationships end up as defending and blaming. And what we know from Jim Tam's work on radical collaboration, he's got a great TED talk. He says that when we get into that defensive mindset and we're operating what we might call below the line, we lose 20 points of IQ and it becomes infectious in your team and we lose the ability to solve problems. We are just covering our asses, right? So you don't want to be down there. I'm hoping when you think about your team, you're not, you're not down there, but there is hope. And it comes in the form of what can happen when you get above the line and you get focused on these three types of intelligence, right? So let's walk you through these steps. In level three of your ladder, if you're there, You've built a real team with some kind of vision, you're connected, and then you've added a bit of EQ. There's some trust. There's good relationships. People think about how each other are feeling. And that is a really solid foundation. We want to get that first. We want to build the emotional foundations. Once we've done that, we can move up to level four, which is to get really good on our practical intelligence and making sure the things we talk about actually happen. And that is a huge challenge for most leadership teams who tend to make decisions that are just kind of words floating around the air and don't translate them into goals and plans and roadmaps and dashboards, right? I do a lot of work in that space of helping that progress and that practical intelligence. If we're getting that right, we've got a team that's got some trust and it's got some ability to turn its ideas into action, then we want to kind of up the ante on the creative analytical, analytical intelligence, that IQ. So the ideas and strategies we're coming up with are inspiring and shaping the future. That's where we're kind of really focused on unlocking the team's IQ. And in that kind of third column, what we're aiming for is, you know, great teams. I built this for leadership teams, but it's true of any kind of senior team. Great teams, we're looking for them to produce intelligent collective action. Intelligent for the IQ, collective for the EQ, action for that practical intelligence, right? That's what we're focused on. That's what we want to do. We want to get together, have some good ideas, and collectively turn it into action. That's pretty simple. So I just want you to reflect. Now, you don't have to put this in the chat box, or if you're watching this later, just have a think about where you are, or where your team is on these levels. A lot of teams I work with are kind of between levels two and three. We can get them up to levels four and five, where your leadership team meet meetings become kind of pretty inspiring and high quality. All right. Now, show you a couple more things. Thanks, Sue. Between three and four is good. Okay. Um, and then I'm going to show you some tools. I want to give you a little toolkit for working with your team to shape the future. So this is the last model for today, I think. But in the same vein as we're talking about three types of intelligence, EQ, 
IQ and PQ in this one, right? I want to show you how they break down because we can measure them. So I've built a diagnostic that can measure the intelligence of your team and the behaviors of your team. And I'll give you a little sense about how it works. I'm not probably going to go through every single box, but let's start down the bottom layer. So if you wanted to improve the emotional intelligence of your team, what can you do? And this is you know, all the research in my book went into this and each of these nine boxes has a chapter to itself in, in the book. Um, we're going to start a box one with setting those foundations of that real team. Like, why do we exist? Who are we? And how do we work? Super important. Then we're going to move over to our behavioral norms. Well, we want to be doing things like um, signaling that we trust the other people. Of course, listening, two ears, one mouth. And more importantly, even building on what other people are saying. We play with the idea of dialogue is better than debate. Dialogue is this idea that we're actually putting our knowledge into the center of the table and building a shared pool of knowledge and creating a solution that way, rather than debating between two different people's ideas. So that's what's happening under kind of norms, right? And then we're moving into check-ins, which is where we've got to be able to monitor the emotional temperature of the team. So if you can do those things, set the foundations, establish the norms, then find ways of checking in to manage the temperature, that's how you're going to build those emotional foundations. If we then go into IQ, if I'm trying to improve the IQ of a team, I'm going to measure its ability to think more deeply about the root causes of a problem. I'm going to measure its ability to think more widely and come up with more range of options. And I'm going to measure its ability to think further ahead about what might happen. And that's where the pre-mortem comes in, right? And then finally, that top level, I'm looking for your practical intelligence. And this is one of my favorite areas at the moment is looking at how good you are at making plans and putting them on a roadmap how good you are tracking progress over time with a dashboard. And uh, my favorite box of all, little secret, is the top right pit stop box, which where we learn that teams who are good at um, what we're going to call get off the racetrack and spend half a day reflecting on your last quarter and planning the next quarter. Teams that do that, there's some good meta-analysis from Tannenbaum and Sarah Soli. You can see the quote, the sources down the bottom. Teams that do that kind of pit stop are 25% more effective over time, according to a big meta-analysis. So there's huge value. This is like a really good kind of um, point to focus on, is that if you want to get good at shaping the future, the, probably the easiest win is to get at good at understanding the value of what you did in the past and learning from that and immediately implementing. That's the easiest win. There's a 25% effectiveness gain right there before you worry about all the other stuff. Okay. I'm just going to start to feel how you could, maybe, I don't, I'm feeling quite excited at this point, but uh, maybe you're starting to feel how you can harness that intelligence. You can unlock the intelligence of your team because the secret is here is that most teams are operating at fairly mediocre levels. Trust is okay. Practical intelligence is okay. IQ is okay. But um, they're also a bit tied in knots in the dynamics in that team that hold them back. If not everyone, for example, is able to say their piece and feel psychologically safe, then you're clearly losing some of the intelligence of the team. So this is important. So I want to give you some tools to kind of unlock this. So part two, here we go. Now, one thing I really want to share with you that connects some of this together is that in the studies of the collective intelligence of teams from the MIT Center of Collective Intelligence, they show that the ability of your team to operate at that kind of top levels of solving problems and IQ and things like that, it actually relates very closely to EQ and the way the team interacts. So they found things like um, equality of conversational turn-taking, i.e. does everyone get to have a say, is predictive of the team's ability to solve problems. So the immediate outtake for you and me is making sure if you're the leader of a team that you take a more facilitation type style where you ask everyone for their views on a topic. And as leader, I say leader speaks last. So we mine for different views and then we add our view at the end, having heard and built on their views. So um, that's one of the really important things is we've got to hear the diversity. Now, one little caveat on that is it doesn't mean that every single decision, you've got to ask everyone around the table, which would be very tedious, particularly for small decisions. So we just need to facilitate in a way we, we cross to several members of the team to get their opinion. We make sure the loud person doesn't dominate. 
we make sure we really hear from the subject matter experts because proof is in that in a team the people that are loudest have more input into the final decision than the subject matter experts and as a leader you've got to change that balance right um so the other thing that actually is predictive of a team's ability to solve problems well together is what's called social sensitivity which is about understanding how other people might be feeling in that room now one of the the, the corollaries of this one of the outtakes of this is it turns out that in, in teams you want to have more women than men right? and i know we've got predominance of women in the room today it turns out the most intelligent type of team has all women except for one token man right that's the, that's when they research this that's the most intelligent type of team you need one man a bit of token to give some slightly different perspective other than that men get in the way right so uh here are some of the things like so and, and that's because women are a little bit more socially sensitive and they lead to teams being able to solve problems better um so that i kind of like that finding um because i've got three daughters and stuff okay now i've um, got about 10 minutes left before we open the q a so i want to just show you some of this toolkit stuff i'm gonna go to here yeah so i'm going to show you a range of tools i've used and I'm going to get your feedback and comments um, at the end on these uh, as we go. All right, so. Um, I can dig into these tools a little bit more, but um, the first thing I'm doing, if I want to help a team shape the future, I will often be called in to do a strategic process. We're actually looking at what is our vision, what is our strategy, etc. And to do that, I will use what's called the strategy house, which is on the left. I might even open this up in Mural and, have a sh and show you around it um hang on a second so i'll just get this a bit bigger so you can see it but um if you are in the position to be writing a strategy anytime soon um julia can you give me a thumbs up if you can see the house right thank you All right um here's how i might build it. i'm not going to run through this whole thing with you but i'm, I'm going to be looking at how do we combine the intelligence of your entire team to create something that's basically on one page right it might have a whole bunch of stuff around it but you want to get it down to one page which is a great way of sharing it with your wider team and getting them on board. So if we're thinking about capturing the team's intelligence, we are going to get them to set a kind of aspiration for where we want to go in the future. Some of this stuff is built on the book playing to win at the top there. What's our aspiration for the future? What are the markets and customers we, 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 where we play and how are we going to win? What's our business model? And then we get into kind of levels of goal setting and, and initiatives below that. And then we end down the bottom with the management systems and necessarily track this, right? So this can take sometimes a day or a week or even a month to get this right. But then it's an awesome tool to communicate and to use in your kind of planning and delivery. So number one tool for you, and I'm going to make these tools available. If you send me an email to rob at robpine.online at the end, and I'll put that email up, I will give you a copy of this that you can use. I mean, it's only a framework, but it's got some tips around it. And it might just inspire you to be able to get your strategy for 2021 or your next three years strategy and try and squish it into one page because strategy is about hard choices and going through a process like this with your team makes you call some of those hard choices and of course um it creates that inspiring debate as well rather than having a flabby strategy trying to get it down to one page is going to capture that intelligence of the different members of your team okay so that is your strategy house and with that i also put i want to touch on goals in the middle here right so that pyramid in the middle is the way i'm starting to learn to think about goal setting which we're talking about the future but the future is about saying well, if we're going to shape it, we need to have some kind of something to aim at. We need to have those goals. And I found this year particularly, I've been doing a lot of work with various different times of leadership teams from big corporates to scale ups and stuff like that. And invariably, it was hard for the team to set goals. And what I've discovered through that process that maybe you can relate with, right? And stick in something in the chat box if you can relate to this. But there's, there's a bit of confusion between a, a doing goal and an impact goal. So if you're writing down goals in your strategy saying like we are going to have 15 marketing events this year or we're going to post a blog every week that's a doing goal and that's totally fine but it's not an impact goal it doesn't say what's going to be the outcome or impact of that so i built this kind of pyramid just to using the example of putting a, putting a person 
on the moon, 1960s thinking, right? Was if we want to get a person on the moon, what do we need to do? That's the kind of impact or outcome to beat the Russians to the moon. If we want to, what do we need to do? We need to build the rocket, of course. And, and then there's another layer you can put in as well. Is like, who do we need to be? Who do we need to be to do that? So I find this combination is working really well to get leadership teams to think, um, you know, for each type of goal you want, can you set a being, doing, an impact metric for it? And typically the impact will be a number, the doing will, and being will be word-based, but they all ladder together beautifully. And that's gonna be surrounded by the first process you can have is decide the five key areas of your business or whatever, it might be six, might be four, that you're gonna measure what you might call the key result areas. So if you think of your business as a system, what are the five areas we need to measure? So typically it might be something like people, product processes, partners, and profit. Profit kind of comes out the end. And you're gonna set a being, doing, an impact goal for each of them. And this is gonna make a huge difference to your ability to shape the future because your whole team is aligned on that. Um, and you can communicate that and connect with everyone in the organization. You can cascade that down much more easily. So goal setting is a huge area. On, on, on for this. So you're going to get our strategy right. We're going to get our goals good. And on the right there, we have our kind of roadmap diagram, very basic diagram, but um, goals and strategies are almost worthless if you don't plan them out quarter by quarter and put them on a schedule and say, and then look down the schedule to say, can we achieve all that? Can we achieve all that stuff? Does it make sense? And I was doing one of these last Wednesday with the leadership team where we put it all out on a table on a really long piece of paper, mapped it every quarter, translate the strategy into projects, put all the projects that we have to do anyway that didn't really come from the strategy, and then we can really see it. And that is a huge moment to help a leadership team shape the future, is to get, get all of this strategic work and goal setting onto a roadmap. And most leadership teams and senior teams, in my experience, haven't done that. They kind of stop at the strategy, maybe they get to the goals. Not a lot of them at that leadership team level get to the roadmap. Okay. I'm showing you a couple more quick things. Okay, thanks, Sue, for your comments there. Yeah, a lot of being goals or doing goals. Yeah, that clarification between being, doing, and impact just for some people just turns a bit of a light bulb on to, to help them get through that confusion, which costs, it costs so much when companies or organizations have unclear goals or just doing goals. All right, so let me show you a couple more quick things. Uh, Okay, the other thing I've got that I'm going to send to you afterwards if you're interested is I took a lot of the best research onto how you can shape your future, literally. I drew on some work from McKinsey called Beating the Transformation Odds, where they discovered that most executives, um, well, in fact, that executives only 26% of the time say their transformations really worked and added value. So there's this huge difference between strategy and execution that we need to close. And I, I've kind of read that paper. I've read The Heart of Change. I've read the work by Cotter. I've read the work by Jim Collins. I've read it all and tested it all and put it into the world. And um, I came up with 24 proven ways of making change. I'll send you this kind of pack of cards if you're interested. And it's a great way of like, you put a, you've got a team. Imagine you've got a team of five or six and you've got 24 cards on the table. And you say, look, here's our strategy and our roadmap. What do we need to do to make sure this actually works? And the clue is a huge amount of it is around communication and people. And you can see six of the cards here. And what's great about this as a team decision-making tool or a team thinking tool is everyone can pick up a couple of cards. They can say, I think we need to play this one right now. And then you, the team can line, okay, here's five ways we need to strengthen our plan. And then you can pull them out a month later and you say, okay, things have changed. We've done those things. What do we need to do now? Um, and it's always thinking about how do we strengthen the chances of this transformation succeeding. So um, 24 cards will help you do that. And that, that technique of putting cards on the table is a great way of unleashing, unlocking that team intelligence, right? Because um, it's not just words floating around. We're actually looking at tangible things. All right. Uh, two more things, then we'll kind of go to Q&A. The pre-mortem I talked about earlier, if you missed the opening story, I'll just recap in 30 seconds. The pre-mortem is to say, all right, we're about to launch our vision for the future, our strategy. At this point, let's imagine it's a year in the future and it's been a complete disaster. What went wrong? That's the pre-mortem. And it works because human brains are good at filling in the gaps in stories. 
So if you put me in the future and you say what went wrong looking backwards, I can fill in the gaps in that story and it surfaces 30% more real risks. And it takes 15 minutes and people love it. And 90% of the time they feel more confident about their plans having put their black hat on for 15 minutes. I think if that's the worst that can happen, we can deal with that. Okay, there is an equivalent of that called a pre-parade, which is also useful in a slightly different way, which is where we say, let's imagine it's been wildly successful. Why was it wildly successful? Because it turns out, like with any given project, when you look back on it, there's this, you, know, you can normally name, like, this is the one reason, or the two reasons. So if had, you imagine, like, looking at vid 19 last year and thinking, why was it successful looking back? There might be kind of two key reasons. So we want to do that now, looking from a project, we're about to kick it off. Let's imagine it's wildly successful. Why? And it might kind of help you kind of boil down on a couple of key things and go, yeah, you know what? Those are the things I really need to make them work. So pre-mortem, pre-parade, you can even do that. If you've got a bigger team around you, you have five people do the pre-parade, five people do the pre-mortem, come back, and you just can get so much richness from mining the intelligence of that group of people from unlocking their team intelligence. All right, last thing I'm gonna share. So these are tools. We're talking about the change cards. We're talking about goal setting. We're talking about roadmaps, strategy houses. These are always ways that you can, tools that you can use in my experience to unlock the team intelligence in your group. So last thing I've got here is um, this idea of having that pit stop. I've mentioned this before, but I'll end on it. It seems like an appropriate way to end. Um, I'm not sure how much detail you can see there, but um, the key questions we're asking is, I'm gonna to say to the leadership teams, every quarter, you take a half day or a day off the track. And you ask three basic questions. Number one is an EQ questions. EQ question. How are our team relationships going? Is this team dynamic working? Yeah. And we can assess that. And you actually get some data around that by actually measuring the EQ, IQ, and PQ in a survey and then putting the results up in the actual pit stop in the leadership team meeting, right? So first thing is how are our relationships? Second thing is you're going to be a PQ question, which is how are our projects running? Are we actually delivering what we said we deliver? What's stopping us? Is our dashboard working? Is our roadmap right? Where are we going with these projects? And the third question you're going to ask is that IQ question. And it's basically going to be, is our strategy still right? Or could we strengthen it further? And what you're learning maybe, what I'm learning these days, is if I set a strategy on the 1st of January 2021, I need to go back into that regularly to make it stronger. And that's been a really great process to understand that the strategy on a page is a moment in time can always be strengthened. You always need to always strengthen. So that's kind of IQ question. So we're going to do that once a quarter. We're going to get off the track and reflect on those things and then make plans for the next quarter. And that's a great cadence for leadership teams. Okay. So um, I would kind of come back to the Titanic story that I started with about deciding for me to spend my life helping people make better decisions and i just want to kind of touch on circle back to that story to say you know was it a good decision because there's sometimes a difference between a good decision can have a bad outcome and a bad decision can have a good outcome but over time if you improve that decision making the number of good outcomes will correlate with it so for me it turned out to be one of the best decisions i've ever made because it turns out this kind of work does use my strengths, I hope, you might disagree with me. Um, it definitely fits my values and it has gone on to pay my mortgage and all the bills of having three little kids as well. So, um, so I hope that the kind of tools that I use in my own life and I use with teams can really help you not just shape the future as in thinking what it might be, but actually shape it to what it's gonna be. So moving from that thinking through to gathering your team together as a group that has strong emotional foundations and has got the practical skills to turn it into reality. So if you want to know more about that stuff, I'm going to open up to a Q&A now because we're doing nicely on time. And I'm also going to say, here's my email address there. If you drop me an email that says vid21 in it, to rob at robpine.online, I'm happy to send you some of the tools we've talked about and you know potentially start a conversation if you're interested.